All right, so this is part two of our talking about genre and understanding how to interpret it. I did not grab something to drink because there is no bottled water here. I am very thirsty, and I don't want to go into the school because no one else is here. It's very late, and it's very dark. Um, anyway, so let's get into Gospels. And this is probably the genre that has the most misunderstanding, I think, out of all of them, even probably the law included. So anyway, the Gospels are eyewitness accounts of the life, the death, the resurrection of Jesus, written specifically to convince the, the reading audience that Jesus was indeed the Son of God. Okay, that sounds straightforward. So let's look at things. The Gospel is a narrative, but it follows uh, the biography format. So we could say in a way that Jesus is a biography and not necessarily narrative, or maybe it's in the middle, that it's a biography that is a narrative. Okay, I, I get that. That makes sense. So when we look at this, this is where we really need to understand genre. All right, because some people might say there are so many false statements in the Gospels. One guy says that there's two angels that are at Jesus' tomb, and one of them says there's one, and one author says there's one woman, and some says there's a slew of women that most of them don't even get named, and some, some say that there's one demon-possessed man that Jesus crosses the Sea of Galilee, Galilee to help. And some say there's two. And there's so many contradictions. Well, at face value, I would say you're right. These do appear to be very different in these different texts. But if we understand the genre of the Gospels, I think we have to agree they don't break any rules. So, for example, the Gospels are eyewitness accounts. I mean, by their very definition, they t each of these guys tell you this. Luke tells us, I've drawn up an account of everything that's been recorded, and I investigated them to make sure they're true. Mark's gospel appears to be based on Peter's accounts of Jesus, as Mark follows Peter around Rome, and as Peter's preaching, Mark's writing down his message, and Mark collects it. Matthew follows Jesus, but he's kind of a follower of Jesus from the background. He's not one of the close disciples that... We see with John, John's very close to Jesus. And so when we understand that these Gospels are eyewitness accounts, I think a lot of things are going to make more sense. So um, one thing we do need to keep in mind, um, not every story of Jesus is recorded. The authors are very selective. Um, some say this is important, some say this isn't. And even when they record similar stories, one might say, well, this detail is not as important to, my, to what I'm trying to portray as it was to this guy. Um, when we talk about the teachings of Jesus, um, you know, again, these are eyewitness accounts. If you sat in a classroom with a friend of yours and you were taking notes, at the end of that, that teacher's lecture, if you had to give a report on what they said, your, account, your eyewitness account of their teaching is going to be very different. Um, for example, I'm a very detailed note taker. So if you were to ask me, can you give us back what the teacher said? It would almost be word for word what they said. I'm a very quick writer. That's why my handwriting is so sloppy. But it would be very accurate to what they said. Whereas if you talk to a, a doodle maker, their account would be very hit and miss. They would tell you the basics of what they said, but it wouldn't be 100%. So keep in mind that the teachings that Jesus gives in the Gospels are based on people's eyewitness accounts of those teachings. There's probably a good chance that the way they remember that might be different than how someone else remembered that. That's why we have two, so that we can look at both of them and let them supplement each other. They come together beautifully. And so um, chances are they're paraphrased. That's why we see some discrepancies in what Jesus says. Um, but notice this. Um, when these discrepancies happen between the Gospels, we might say in our culture, boy, since the Gospels don't line up 100%, then they're not accurate. Here's a little bit of a thing. You know, some of you know that I was kind of a, a troublesome teenager. And one time I got myself in a little bit of trouble, and the police were talking to me and my friend. And we, had, my friends and I always had this idea that we always, before we went out, we would always, um, we'd always get together and we would tell We'd get our stories straight, basically. So if any of us ever got in trouble, all of our stories would line up. Well, one day we did get in trouble, and uh, the officer was talking to us, and he said, you know, when your stories make perfect sense, when they line up perfectly, that is cause, that is cause for us to be suspect, because they match up too well. And 
when they match up too well, that lets us know that they're fake. He said what we look for is when your stories don't line up. I probably shouldn't tell that I got in trouble one time, but that's okay. Jesus, Jesus has worked beautifully in my life, so I'm not ashamed of that. I hope you're not either. I think we'll all be okay. But anyway, when, um, when, our, when the stories have discrepancies, that reinforces that they're true. And so when we look at the Gospels, if all four Gospels were identical, we'd say, this sounds made up. This sounds like one guy basically came up with a story and his three buddies agreed with them. But when we see that there's some discrepancies there, we see, well, maybe these aren't made up. And again, why are there discrepancies? Because these are based on eyewitness accounts of what happened. Just like when you watch the news, these, the news is based on eyewitness accounts, and we take their word for it. Like, whenever they see those people, and where I grew up in Indiana, and even Ohio they did this, they'd always find somebody who just kind of looked different. A friend of mine one time asked them after they got done doing it, he said, why do you always pick the, 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 the strangest looking people sometimes? And they said, because those kind of people reinforce the truthfulness of what we're saying. If we found someone that was wearing a three-piece suit and looked polished, people would say, you made this up. But if we can find people that look like the average person, that speak like the average person, that reinforces it really happened. And so that's how it is with the Gospels, that these stories reinforce... Um, that these stories have really happened. And again, the people who were alive in Jesus' day, or the people, I'm sorry, when the Gospels are written, those people are, some of those people are still alive when these stories are written. So if they were untrue, somebody could easily say, that's not right. That's been fabricated. But we never see that. In fact, um, that, again, that just reinforces their truthfulness. And they still basically tell the same story. They have what's called the same kerygma. The kerygma is a Greek word meaning um, the teachings about Jesus. So they all basically still teach that Jesus came, lived, he performed signs and wonders, he taught us how to live, he died and was resurrected for us. And so yes, there's a, a few discrepancies that might happen, but they don't get in the way of this basic teaching. So whether Jesus healed one demonic possessed man or two, the point is he healed the demonic possessed people. You know, doing one is just as impossible as doing two. I can't do that. Or, you know, well, I can't believe that Jesus was raised from the dead because this guy said there's just one lady and this guy says there's like 20 ladies. Well, whether it's one or 20, Jesus, they still report Jesus was raised from the dead. And I would argue, you know, one guy's just focused on one particular lady and ignoring the rest. But anyway, um, they still all basically tell the same story with no discrepancies. Another fun fact is that first century biographies, they don't tell all the details about a person. Um, sometimes they leave out stuff that they don't feel is important to that story. You know, when I, I read a biography one time and I put it down because I was like, this has nothing to do with this guy being the coach of this football team. Like, this is a meaningless story, so I put it down. In the Bible times, they're like, no, if it doesn't specifically highlight why he's important, we're not telling you that story. I, we talked about this last week, that in first century biographies, they can rearrange the material to highlight different aspects of their life. And um, first century biographies will focus more on how someone died. Because they believe that someone's death indicated, or the manner of someone's death indicated what kind of person they were. Um, also, um, oh, next. So when we read the Gospels, we want to ask this. What is this gospel teaching us about who Jesus is? Very similar to the Old Testament narratives. But now we know that Jesus is God. So we want to ask specifically, who is the, what is this gospel story telling us about who he is? Secondly, very similar to the Old Testament narrative, what is this story telling me about what Jesus has done? And thirdly, what does the gospel tell me about what it means to follow Jesus? And again, are there discrepancies? Yes, because these are based on eyewitness accounts. But... Regardless, it's still going to meet these three things. It tells us who Jesus is, what he's done, and how we are to follow him. I think I'm going to check my computer real fast to make sure it's not about to die. Anyway, the next one we want to look at is the letters. And the letters are written for specific situations in the lives of God's people at specific locations. So when we translate these... We want to ask, what is the historical context to which the author wrote? So again, we never start with, what does this mean to me? Well, you've asked the wrong question. What, is, what we want to say is, what did the author intend to say to them? 
Alright, so for example, when Paul says that women should not speak in the church, what was the situation that caused him to say that? Well, apparently, um, there's a bunch of language diversity there, and people are preaching in different languages, and some of the people who are a little um, less than educated, unfortunately they're ladies at the time, aren't able to understand the different languages, so they're asking, apparently, their husbands in the, the middle of the service, hey, can you translate this for me? I can't understand a word he's saying. And so the author says, you know, just women shouldn't speak because it's creating chaos in the service. So we want to ask the question, well, what's the difference between that biblical audience and us? You know, well, in our biblical context, we all speak the same language. They, they didn't. Or for the most part, we probably all speak the same language, I would assume, if we're going to the same church. So that would be a huge difference. And then we come to this idea, well, when Paul says that women should not speak in the church, what is the principle behind that command? Well, the principle behind it is that there's chaos in the service. There's things going on that are disrupting the flow of God's word being spoken and worship of God happening. So the principle behind this might be we should not create an atmosphere of chaos in our worship service. All right. Well, again, we could ask the question, is this something that we see in Old Testament and New Testament? Is this something that is timeless? And I would say both of those are. Then we ask, how do we live out this principle? Well, that's easy. Don't cause chaos in the worship service. If you are being disruptive, um, stop it. Don't do it. But it makes it stop. Just no excuse. Just do not be disruptive in the service. And how do you know you're disruptive? If everybody looks at you, you're disruptive. And I might even say this, if you're, if you're self, you need to make sure your cell phone's off before service. And it's interesting to me, adults, I'm saying this, I'm going to preach now. It's not Sunday. I've never had a teenager's cell phone interrupt a church service before. I've had several adults. Now, I should clarify, I'm not speaking specifically to Sand Hill Church. This is, I'm saying in general, over 15 years of ministry, it's always been adult cell phones. So turn off your cell phone. That's what we should take from this principle. Anyway, let's keep going. Last, we need to talk about the apocalyptic genre. This is the smallest genre of scripture. Um, probably one of the most misunderstood genres. Apocalyptic is, um, this is a prophetic vision that uses intense imagery to convey that God is in control and there's hope for his people. We see this in three specific places. And I think you can see this. This looks okay in the room. All right. And Daniel and specifically more towards the end of Daniel. Matthew 24, um, most of the whole chapter, but specifically 36 through 51, and the book of Revelation. Each of these books are written at a very chaotic time in Israel's history. Daniel is written when the Israelites have been taken to Babylon. They're living in exile. Um, their ability to worship Yahweh, as they've been commanded to, is being um, um, put in jeopardy. In Matthew, this is a time when the Israel or when the temple is about to be destroyed and Jerusalem is about to be wiped out. It's a very chaotic time. The Book of Revelation is depicting when the um, this new government is going to try to destroy the worship of God and take the focus from God and put it on themselves. And so each of these are written to a specific audience at a specific time that is going to face difficulties, and it reminds them, regardless of what you go through, God is in control. And there's hope for his people. So what is the point of apocalyptic literature? One, the point is the worship of God. The book of Revelation has more worship songs in it than any other book of the Bible except for the book of Psalms. I think it's, it's at least got eight. And that depends because on some of them it, it has a worship song. Then it says the word and. And then it has a second worship song. So like within the small chunk of scripture, it depends if you count that as one or if you count it as two. I think it could be up to maybe 12 or 13, but it's at least got eight. The next book is Luke, which has seven worship songs in it. So the point is worship. When I was a kid, the church I went to was obsessed with the book of Revelation. And I remember one Wednesday night, the pastor had somebody draw this huge leopard creature with seven heads. And all these little stick figure Christians were running away from it. And the leopard heads were eating Christians. And there was gore everywhere. And it scared me to death. And I never read it again till I was in college. Because their focus was the horror and fear of Revelation. Well, no. There's more focus on worship than any other book of the Bible except for Psalms. 
we, when we get done reading the book of Revelation, we need to be in a worshipful attitude that God's in control, not fear the book. Two, we need to read Revelation and understand that it is hard to interpret. Anyone that says, and you know, my dad had a book when I was a kid that said, this will tell you exactly verse by verse what each of these things mean. Well, I read it. It actually doesn't do a very good job doing that. Um, but anyway, we need to interpret with humility. This stuff is difficult to understand. And when someone says that they've got it mastered, we need to be very skeptical of that. Because if you can't read it and get all the answers from it, chances are they didn't either. But then why would they say they did? Because you're going to buy their book? That's cynical, Pastor Jeff. It's cynical, but it's true. And number three, how did the original audience understand this? With, a book of, with any other book, I think we're usually okay with that. You know, how would the Thessalonians have understood 1 Thessalonians? How would the Galatians have understood this? Well, when we get to the book of Revelation, we completely skip that step. And we say, what should we take from it? How do we understand it? No, how do the seven churches that John writes to that are around 90 to 96 AD, how do they understand what he's saying? Four, don't look for a chronological sequence of events. This book is not intended to be a timeline. I know that there is a very famous pastor who has a, like a 50-foot wall chart. And he says, this is the order how things will... When you read the book of Revelation, it... You can't help but come away from this and say, this book's not written in order. Because in one chapter, it'll say something has been destroyed. But then later, it'll talk about it being not destroyed. And it's like, well, I thought it got... Well, no, because since Jesus is outside of time and he's conveying the revelation of John, it would make sense that his chronology of events is told out of time. And so things don't line up. And then... You read through some of the things and then they go back and re-talk about them and then they tell the story again and then they go back and talk about them again. It's like, it, it's very difficult to make a timeline out of the book of Revelation. Number five, uh, with apocalyptic literature, we want to take it very seriously. You know, we don't want to say, oh, this is a joke and, oh, you know, you can't understand that so don't worry about it. Nobody should preach from... Daniel 7 or Matthew 24 or the book of Revelation, that, that's not for us to, well, you're not taking it seriously because if it's in the Bible, it's intended for God's people to read, but it doesn't always mean that we take it literally. Um, the Bible, or the, the apocalyptic literature is using very intense language to describe things that are beyond our ability to comprehend. And so a lot of this is very heavily symbolic. So we could ask a lot of questions. Like when it says that Jesus comes in and his head is white as can be. And I, I didn't realize this. I was reading this yesterday. Um, I always thought it just said that Jesus' hair is white. But actually it says his entire head is white. So it's like Jesus has like a, a nicely tanned neck below. But above the head, he's straight albino. Well, that's weird looking. Well, what probably it's, it's referring to an Old Testament reference where it says in the Proverbs that a person's wisdom will be told by how much gray hair they have on their head. And the whiter their hair, the wiser they are. Now imagine Jesus' hair is not white, his beard is not just white, his entire hair, beard, and face is white. So Jesus is the complete wisest person of them all. And we miss that if we just say, oh, when Jesus shows up, it's going to look like he's got baby powder all over his head. He's going to be so white, the sun's going to glisten right off of him. Well, no, we're, you're missing the point. The point is that this is causing us, again, to worship Jesus because he's the wisest of them all. Um, there's another passage where it says that Jesus is going to have seven eyeballs. Oh, my word, Jesus is scary sounding. Well, no, what it means is seven means perfection. So if these are the perfect amount of eyes, it means that Jesus sees everything perfectly. That he's able to judge perfectly. That he's able to do everything perfectly because he sees everything well. But if we take it literally and we say, wow, Jesus is going to be one freaky guy. You know, all these old people at church always say, I can't wait till I see Jesus. I don't want to. He looks like a monster. Well, no. John's being very symbolic. Um, next, the authors are trying to explain fantastic concepts with their own limited vocabulary. Um... You know, I always say this, try to pretend that we could go back to prehistoric caveman times and 
we're not going to have a, a debate about whether dinosaurs or cavemen exist. We're just, we're, we're, pretend with me. So let's say we go back in time to when the, the cavemen existed. Now let's try to explain to them the internet. How would that conversation go? I had some of my kids do it last year, and they're like, well, you know, imagine, oh man, how, imagine lightning. And you know how lightning makes image, and it's like, oh, oh, that's easy. Internet like lightning. And well, no, it's not like lightning. But first you need a computer. Well, what is computer? Well, a computer is kind of like a, um, it's kind of like a, kind of like a, a, a rock. Oh, a computer is rock with lightning. Well, no, that doesn't sound good either. You see the difficulty. Um, so, now imagine John is seeing stuff that no one can describe. And the words that he uses fall short of what it truly is. And even John admits that. Because notice, he uses one key word several times. He always says, like. I saw this and it looked like. It wasn't completely, but it was like it. You know? And we understand that. That when we say something's like, there's a, there's a connection but we don't want to take that connection too far. And so, um, I'm trying to think of an example. Maybe I don't have an example. I don't think I do. But, you know, for example, there's this passage where it says that God is like a rainbow. Oh, so we should understand that God's just this big rainbow in the sky, and I wonder if there's a pot of... No, he says he's like a rainbow. That there's qualities of the rainbow that God has. And you might say, well... What's, what's that? Well, again, maybe we come back to number five and we say maybe he's using intense imagery. What do we know about rainbows in the Bible already? Well, it's a sign of God's faithfulness and his care for humanity from Genesis chapter 9. So when John sees the Lord sitting on his throne, maybe John's saying, I saw the most faithful being in the world and the whole existence of all things who is faithful and cares for people and promises to preserve them. Maybe that's what John's getting. I don't know because I want to make sure, go back to the other one, I want to make sure that I'm being humble. And I, I don't know that's what it means, but it, it, sounds, it sounds closer to what the Bible's already said than some guy's rants and ravings on television. Um, and this is one, I should have put this up there, I did. John loves to quote the Old Testament, and so, do, so, do, so does all apocalyptic literature. And they won't always tell you we're quoting the Old Testament. They expect you to know that. And if you don't know it, they're not going to stop and explain. You know, when I say this, I'm referencing Proverbs, or I'm referencing Genesis 9, or this, this. They expect you to know the Old Testament. So when we read that there's these deadly locusts in Revelation, they probably expect you to know that in the book of Joel, there's also a deadly plague of locusts. And there's also a deadly plague of locusts in the book of Exodus. That maybe is asking us to go back and read those stories to understand what's happening here. Versus, well, you know, what, is this, what does this locust thing mean to me? What does the Left Behind series say? Okay, you probably shouldn't do that. Um, notice, there are places where it does describe what's going on. So, in Revelation 1, it talks about Jesus walking around. And there's these seven candlesticks. Are these seven golden lampstands. But then later in that chapter, it says the lampstands are the church. Okay, well, it explains that. And we need to, whenever the Bible says this is what this symbol clearly means, we've got to remember that and keep it in our minds. And finally, number eight, which is number nine because I added one. We need to remember that unlike other genres, we don't want to get lost in the details. All the other 65 books of the Bible, when we study them, we want to take apart every single word. So when Paul says, therefore, we say, what is this therefore, therefore? Or when he says, but, we say, well, what is he contrasting? When he says the word if, we want to get focused on that two-letter word. But when we read Revelation, we don't want to get caught up in the details. When we read Daniel, we don't want to get too caught up in the details because the main thing is that we want to look at the larger picture. And in all three of these places, Daniel... Matthew 24 and the book of Revelation, the key focus is always the worship of God. And we want to make sure that when we, when we read this literature, that we don't get caught up on the wrong things. So with that, this has been a very long jump into genre. And hopefully this genre will help you to feel better about the Bible. That you, I can turn this off now and stand right in front of you. And my hope is that as we read the Bible, we always want to ask the question, what is the Bible saying? And too often, 
Um, the thing that we immediately go to, and you've said it, and I've said it before in my past, the question we always want to ask is, what does the Bible mean to you? Well, that's a very dangerous question. It doesn't sound dangerous, but when we ask that question, the first thing we're saying is, it doesn't matter what the author wanted, want, wanted the audience to hear back then, and it doesn't matter what he intended to say. What matters right now is how you think it applies to you. And that sounds good, and we want to get to that step, but that's not the first step. That's like if the first day of driver's ed, the teacher says, okay, we're going to the Indy 500, and you're going to drive a car at 200 some miles per hour. I hope you don't explode. Whoa, maybe one day we can get to that, but the first day of driver's ed, we probably better teach the basics. And so when we come to Bible study, we want to do the same thing. We want to say, what is the author intending to say to that audience? And how is he saying it? And how is he using a specific genre to teach those people? And once we understand that, now we're in a position to where we can say, all right, what is he saying to us now? We don't skip that step. That is the most crucial step. But unfortunately, it's usually the step that we don't even think about because we're, we want to get to, what, it, what do I think it means? What, you know, at Bible study, here's my opinion. Boy, I can't wait to share what I think it means. Well, that's, what you think it means is almost irrelevant to what the author wants it to mean. You know, when we say, when God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life, what is it that John is trying to teach us? Because if you say, well, Jeff, what does that make you think of? Oh, man, well, that means to me, that means, oh, man, boring Sunday school classes where we had to memorize the same verses every single year for Easter, and we've got to stand up in front of everyone, and I just don't care for that verse very much because of that reason. Whoa, whoa, that's not at all what John meant. What John wanted to do was to show us the full scope of God's love and his care and concern for humanity, that he would even give his own son to die for humanity so that we could be in a relationship with the Lord. And I know that's kind of an extreme situation, but we just want to be careful that when we study the Bible, we study it well. Which is why next week we're going to look at context. Context is my favorite word of Bible study. and one, In fact, one of my favorite words in general. So next week we're going to look at it. We're going to talk about what is context and why is it so important for us to put everything in context. So with that, thank you. And um, I'll see you when I see you. Have a good night. Bye.